Grant. I'm the executive director here. And I want to thank you, first of all, for coming. I hear the traffic is harrowing out there. So thank you for making it and waiting and stopping and starting for I don't even know how long. Thank you so much. It's lovely to see you. I'm going to start by thanking our media sponsor tonight, Magic 104.9, and also Fair State University, Diversity and Inclusion Office. It takes many partners and many people to make events like this come to fruition. And so if we could just give a little bit of round of applause, SFU. Thank you. You're in my heart, maybe not to yours. Um, we are going to start with an original spoken word poem by Kit Kane that will begin our evening. She'll be followed directly by Dr. Pilgrim. He, I, asked how I should introduce him, and he said, point and say that's him. <laughs> <laughs> he will tell you more about himself in an eloquent way that I cannot match, so you'll have to wait for that. Directly following Dr. Pilgrim, we will have a Q&A, so if you have a burning desire and a question or anything you want to say, there will be time for that afterwards. So again, thank you for coming, and I'm going to introduce the best introduction I've had. Can you hear me? No, not you guys. The person back there, can you hear me? All right, good. So a couple things real quick. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming out. Uh, the older I get, the more appreciative I am of opportunities to stand before people and talk. I don't tell people what to believe. I tell them what I believe. I, I do not present myself as an expert, though I've spent the last three, four decades reading and traveling and talking, 
but I recognize in every audience there are people whose insight is at least as valuable as mine and in many instances more valuable than mine. And so it's really humbling that people would come out to hear me. Uh, if you had anything to do with me coming tonight, can you raise your hand? Uh, can you look around at those people? I want you to look at them for two reasons. Number one, I'm very thankful. And number two, if this goes poorly, <laughs> then you know the people. So raise your hands again. <laughs> and then I see my supervisor is here, uh, Dave Eichler, the president of Ferris State University. Give him a hand. Um, so on the one hand, uh, it's kind of cool that your supervisor shows up. On the other hand, my supervisor is here. So I got to kind of watch what I say. Uh, this way he won't have to just watch it on YouTube. He can, he'll actually be a part of it. Uh, I have a lot of friends in the audience. The Steeds are here. Uh, my wife and partner, same person, is here. Uh, I have neighbors here. Um, you know, again, just thank you very much. So let's jump right into this. And they got this newfangled technology. So I had to figure out how to make this work. Uh, about the images. Uh, I have to show some images, uh, otherwise I'm trying to paint, uh, oh, and thank you, that was wonderful. Okay. Um, well, I just have to show some images. I don't do it to tantalize people, titillate people, upset people, anger, none of that. I'm just trying to show you the image of the thing I'm talking about. So, we're adults, so we have to look at some of it. And I did not bring some of the really horrible images, but I, I recognize that people have different levels of sensitivity and, and, well, let's leave it at that. Okay, he told me I had to point this thing. There we go. I don't know how many of you know Stetson Kennedy. Oh, uh, real quick story. And by the way, they said I only have two and a half hours, so <laughs> I'm gonna try to get through this as quickly as I can. I never met Stetson Kennedy, uh, but it's so, I, he was always a hero, okay? Uh, he, if you remember, uh, pretended to be a member of the Klan, joined the Klan, and then wrote the book, The Klan Unmasked, remember that guy? And he could, before he could get the book published, he actually went to DC Comics. He was so frustrated, he couldn't get his, he couldn't get his message out, so go to, he goes to the comic book people, and they actually do the series Superman versus the Klan, okay, if, if you remember this story. And then eventually he got the book published. Anyway, they reissued the book a few years ago, and it says, with a new introduction from David Pilgrim. I'm like, I didn't, I didn't write an introduction. So they took it, a part of an essay that I wrote without asking my permission and, and put it at the front of the book. I actually would have said yes. I would have, I would have thought, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, so I was going to call down just to give him a hard time, and he passed away right around that time. So anyway, I wrote the introduction to his new book. Uh, <laughs> so from Stetson Kennedy, uh, I love this quote, uh, and if you've collected this kind of stuff, memorabilia is not actually the right word for it. They're, they're really you know, just racist artifacts or racist objects. But anyway, if you collect so-called races, remember, and I know uh, Bayard is here, and he, 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 he collects, um, then you can kind of visualize this guy running around at, at the, the 1960s when people are throwing away all their whites-only signs and, and their all, all the segregation memorabilia, and he's collecting it because he kind of sees the future. And that's, that's the kid that I was, you know, the one running around collecting stuff. Keep doing that. That's what you can do with a PhD from the Ohio State University is, <laughs> is to, uh, okay, real quick, I, okay, because we gotta get serious. I gotta, I gotta tell one little other thing before we get started. I know some of you have heard this story. If you've heard this story already, just talk amongst yourselves. For the rest of you, I'm in Sam's Club on, uh, I just gotta tell you, I, I know I shouldn't, but I'm in Sam's Club on, what is that, Alpine? And uh, this woman comes up to me and she has a sweater. And she says, you know, you look like you're the size of my husband, so could you put this sweater on? And I'm like, that is, <laughs> that's just odd to ask somebody to do that. And so I says, no, I'm not going to do that. And so she, said, she says, well, it, you know, could I, could I lay it, lie it on your back? I said, I'm not sure if it's lie or lay it. No, you can't uh, put that on my back. And she said to me, you're the meanest man I ever met in my life. I, I don't even even know this woman, and she was like, you're so mean and rude. I was like, listen, if you needed help and I thought you needed help, I would, I would, if you were in a ditch, if your tire was flat, if you needed money, whatever, I would try to help you. But I'll be damned if I'm gonna put on a University of Michigan jersey just so, 
just so you can see if it fits your husband. And if you love your husband, you wouldn't make him wear it either. So I, I say that also because uh, President Eisen is from the University of Michigan. So, And in case you haven't figured it out, I am from The Ohio State University. So anyway, this is sort of the old room. We used to have 500 square feet. Uh, that room now has sex as objects in it. We have people come from all over. Uh, Tracy Bush and uh, some of uh, our colleagues there are doing a great job with that. But it was just 500 square feet. Some of you, how many of you went in that old room? And so the, the advantage of being in that old room was that you, you just really had the sense of being overwhelmed, which is kind of what we wanted. Um, you, you really felt like these objects were so pervasive in our society that you could almost not breathe. Uh, but it was so small, only 500 square feet, that it was really functionally visual storage. But we did a lot of good work in that room. Um, I know a, a, a lot of you probably have seen these objects. And I, I, show, I could show any number of objects. Uh, our website, we just changed it because <clears throat> it's a wonderful website, by the way, thanks to Franklin Hughes. But we had like a mistake on there. <clears throat> it just hadn't been updated. Uh, it said we had 5,000 objects. Uh, we probably have closer to 14,000. And every day we get objects from all over the United States. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, sometimes I will get some, and I'm like, man, I wish I hadn't bought this because now I, I'm getting it for free from, from someone from California. But we're growing, we're growing. We have people coming to visit from all over the country. And, uh, but my point is this, and I'm a sociologist, that if you show me the objects that a society creates, I don't need to talk to the people in the society. I can tell you about their attitudes, their tastes, their values, and their behaviors just by looking at the objects that they create. And quite frankly, a society where race matters the way it did in the U.S. means, or it does in the U.S., means that we racialize objects. Uh, and you'll kind of see that a little bit today. So the lawn jockey. Uh, actually, somebody near my home had, had one of the older ones, and I would tell Peg that I know their schedule and that uh, we could get that thing. I mean, the, <laughs> the, um, um, I, but then we found out it was chained down. And eventually, uh, I, I think they sold it or something because it's no longer there. But when I, see, when I see a lawn jockey, if I go into a neighborhood and I see a lawn jockey, uh, at least for that home, uh, the message to me is, is you're not welcome here. If I see a lot of lawn jockeys, I'm, I'm not welcome and I, don't, I just don't feel welcome. You know, and I don't think I'm alone in that. Uh, in terms of separation, and that's really what I want to talk about today, this kind of us versus them kind of piece, uh, this right here is what's called a, a pathetic ballot. Isn't that a wonderful name? I mean, wonderfully accurate name. But this is one, I think this one's uh, Stay in Your Own Backyard. And so we have lots of images in the Jim Crow Museum which say to people, stay where you are, stay here. This is your place. And uh, I'm going to talk about how that parallels with some other groups. But the message here is, now, here's the thing. Sheet music is an everyday object. What do people do with sheet music? Well, they play the music, right? In the, in the comforts of their home, they would sit at a piano and they would play. And so it became racist propaganda as entertainment. We did that so much in this culture. Uh, this is a picture by Gordon Parks. I did, oh, by the way, he's also one of my heroes. Everybody know Gordon Parks? Uh, you, you, well, chef! <laughs> he's a bad, what? <laughs> Damn, did nobody see the movie? Or is it just, uh, are there any black people in here? I'll try again. <laughs> chef! I guess I am the only black person. There you go, there you go. Shut your mouth. All right, so anyway, he wrote the score, to, score for that. But, but I think he's mostly, and he did The Learning Tree. Remember the movie The Learning Tree? But I think he's mostly known for his photographs. And you know there's the really famous photograph of the African-American woman with the mop standing with the, with the uh, American flag behind her. Anybody remember that picture? So symbolic, it's just a wonderful image. Anyway, I did not know this. Just before I was born, uh, Gordon Parks was commissioned by Life magazine to take pictures of the separate lives lived by African-Americans and European-Americans. And he came to Mobile, Alabama. And this is one of the images that he shot. This is like three blocks from my home. And I, never, I saw that picture for years and years and years. never knew that it was three blocks from my home. Uh, and of course, I grew up in what I call a half world where we were divided and, and uh, long, n another story. Uh, I don't know, I, I have a book coming out in, um, uh, first plug, 
uh, in, um, I think it's in September, and it's called, uh, I, have to, I have to think about the name, it's called Watermelons, Nooses, Straight Razors, and Other Stories from the Jim Crow Museum. And uh, I'm putting this picture in there, even though it has nothing to do with any of the chapters, because it's just, I couldn't shake this image out of my head, where um, um, there's just a person using another person as a chair. And uh, a couple years ago, uh, Franklin Hughes, who works in my office, and Patty Tran, who works in my office, uh, we went to Baltimore. We do buying trips for the First Lady's Attic, where we buy clothes for, for young people in college. And we, 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 we have like a whole list of things we buy. But we went into this black memorabilia show, and there was a chair, a cement chair, made uh, uh, of a little black boy holding, and people would sit on him. And, and, and I should have bought it, but I had no way to get it back, and I just, they wanted too much, but I, I really regret not having bought that. And I was complaining to someone one day about not having purchased it, and they says, well, have you ever seen this picture? And so I saw that picture. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna, uh, uh, this is not, the stuff I talk about is not pleasant, and um, you know, I actually can come back here and talk about cooking. Uh, my wife and I, we cook a good gumbo together, uh, mostly me. Uh, I, I can talk about sports, I can talk about, I don't want to talk about politics. I really, 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 really don't want to talk about politics. But I can talk about politics. But I, but I come today to talk about some of these really ugly things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you real quick the ugliest thing you'll ever hear in your life. Um, so uh, I, I have this newspaper index, which is like a, um, a 4,000 newspapers from the, eight, from the 1700s to yesterday. And it's every newspaper, every, or not every newspaper, it's 4,000, but every page of all newspapers. And so one night I was just thinking, um, my father-in-law has always, he has said to me, well, you know the Irish had to face science that said no Irish need apply. And, and, and then I remember later there was a debate about whether or not that really happened or the extent to which that happened. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to type that in. So I typed in no Irish need apply. And there there were in newspapers advertisements that said no iris need apply. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then in the back of my brain, I thought, you know what? I'm going to type in human leather. Just, you know, just, just type that in. And there's a chapter in the book that, that's going to come out that where I talk about this. And this is what I found, that there were, there were newspaper accounts, and even though our, uh, President Trump doesn't, appreciate the New York Times as much as I do, I'm assuming if they mention something in a matter-of-fact way a number of times, it may have occurred. But also the St. Louis Post and the, Sac Sacramento, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle and the, the, what's the one with the B? Um, uh, uh, what's it, the what? Sacramento B and I. So I have a whole list of newspapers where they, in a matter-of-fact way, it's not even the story, it's not even the main part of the story, what they do is they discuss black people's skin being used to be for belts, for wallets, for the book bindings, for the, the leather for book bindings, for a race, uh, um, razor strop, the thing that you sharpen your razor on, just anything that you would use as a leather product. And so I have this, I have dozens and dozens of those in there. And you, you just think how far we've come as a culture, not just that that was done, but that it was reported in the paper. So when our papers, and so when I look at something like this, it doesn't seem as, as unlikely, given that those things did occur. Uh, I at one point wanted to create a funnel in the museum where, uh, of course, it was big and then it got smaller and smaller and, and you were surrounded by the laws that you know, kept blacks and whites from playing checkers, from boating together, from doing anything that implied social equality, anything that implied intimacy, anything that it implied that the racial hierarchy was wrong. Uh, because of a, a space limitation, we ended up just creating kind of a, a wall of sorts. But uh, my original idea was to you know, kind of um, just kind of close in on you. But if you come to the museum, and you'll kind of see the wall that we created. Uh, unfortunately, um, well, let me put it this way, because um, I've, I've always prided myself on trying to be objective. I think one of the, there's disadvantages to being a, an, a sociologist, as Tony Baker can tell you, but there's, there's advantages, and one of those is, is that we're trained to be critical but objective. And so I've tried to be objective in my analysis uh, of, of the U.S. and where we're going. 
So for the last two decades or so, as I travel the country, one of the things I, I would always say is, is that the United States is today more democratic and more egalitarian than it has ever been. And there would be people screaming at me, screaming at me, oh no, things are worse than what I said. No, let's look at the objective measures in our culture. And I would say we are more egalitarian and more democratic than we have been. And I no longer say that. I'm not saying we're 1950, but I'm saying that I think we've taken a couple steps back here recently. So anyway, a t-shirt like this, um, well, at first when I saw that, my first thought was, I got to have it. <laughs> and uh, so we have, a, we have a whole collection on, on uh, President Obama. Uh, like I've said before, I think he was a cottage industry uh, for racist objects, uh, where he was presented as every racial caricature you could think of. And here's the deal. I don't think there's been a president in my lifetime with whom I don't disagree. And I, I, I mean, there's something, uh, some significant policy disagreement that I have with them. And in many instances, I think that were I president, and look at me, it's easy to do that, right? I'm living in Rockford pretending to be president. But were I president, I would do this different, and I would do this different. So it's fine to disagree with people. It's absolutely fine. But it's not fine to disagree with a person and then portray them as a monkey. Uh, it should just be sufficient to say I disagree with them. I think they're wrong. You don't have to present them as Hitler. You know, and I think when we present people as, as, as Hitler, what we do is we trivialize uh, what, what occurred with uh, uh, the Third Reich, and, and, and that's wrong. But we, political discourse in this country has taken a step backwards. Uh, students keep me up to date on the newest and latest in racist stuff. Uh, so uh, one student I was talking to, he was like, well, have you heard of Trayvoning? And I knew it was bad just because uh, they were saying it to me. Um, it's like when someone sees me and they go, oh, you know, I saw something the other day and it made me think about you. It was uh, a guy being lynched or it was some, you know, something really horrible. And so when they said Trayvoning, I thought, well, this is probably going to be bad. And that's what it was. People would pose uh, as, as if they were the corpse of, of Trayvon Martin. And then, of course, the, the, I won't say it was replete with, but there were certainly many examples of targets uh, of Trayvon Martin uh, that people would, would, would actually use as shooting targets. We have a section in the museum showing the, sort of the history of using black people as targets. Now, think about it. If I'm using anybody as a target, <coughs> uh, that's safe space to do that, right? Um, I mean, you don't have to be a, a psychologist to understand the sort of uh, uh, the need, uh, the psychological dynamics that involve in me in some place in an unchallenged way being able to shoot some representative of a various group. I was at Comstock Park, the Deltaplex, back when they used to run um, 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 gun shows there. Anybody know what I'm talking about, the Deltaplex and stuff? And so one day I went in and I saw a guy, he was selling targets. Well, everybody in there was selling targets, but this one guy. So I said to him, uh, what's your most popular target? And he says, you're not going to want it. And of course, I knew I was going to want it. And what it was, was it was a, quote, black gang representative. And so people were buying it, you know, $2. And you ask yourself, again, what does it mean to depict a certain group of people as the target when you're shooting? Um, in 1994, I think it was, I was at Encore. Was it 1994? I don't know. Yeah, I think it was around 1994. And, and you know, and it was in New Orleans. And you know, New Orleans used to be like just all jazz and, and overrated food and what, I mean, if you want good food, go to Mobile, Alabama. I mean, the, the, that's where I was raised up. New Orleans is like food for Northerners that don't know any better and, and so they go down there and they think, oh, this food is great. Well, you're comparing it to Grand Rapids, okay? So <laughs> that, I'm, just, I'm just trying to see if you're still out there. So anyway, um, so instead of these old wonderful food places and jazz places, there's still a few, but they've been replaced by t-shirt shops in a lot of cases. It's really kind of sad. But in one instance, there was um, a t-shirt that I saw, and it had um, uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, not at the time Secretary Clinton, but Secretary Clinton, um, I, I guess at the point she would have been so-called First Lady Clinton. She was standing behind uh, President Clinton, uh, you know, uh, simulating, uh, sodomizing him. And so the message was that she's, the, in their marriage, she's the real what? Say it. Yeah, she's the real man. And, and, and I thought, man, I should buy this. 
but I didn't collect that kind of stuff. I collected racist stuff. And even though I would have people say to me, they, you travel around saying you're against injustice, but you only collect objects about racism, anti-black racism. I was like, yeah, because it's the Jim Crow Museum. I mean, you wouldn't go to the Holocaust Museum and ask where's the Jim Crow stuff, right? And so I, this is what I collected. But in the back of my mind, I was like, man, I, I should collect this. Well, anyway, um, I, I got another chance, not on a t-shirt, but on a, but on a, a, a magazine. Although in this case, it was supposed to be satirical. And uh, I don't know if you, like me, you, you, you get to a certain point in your life where you decide that you want to read the stuff you, they used to make you read. And so, um, you know, I, I, I you know, start rereading Martin Luther King's writings, Dr. King's writings. And, um, you know, one of those, of course, is a letter from Birmingham jail, uh, which is, in my opinion, uh, the greatest public letter ever written. And uh, in there, there's this quote, you know, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice what? Everywhere. And people would know that quote all the time. They've never read the letter. Um, but I started really thinking about what that meant. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start collecting this other stuff, use it in some of the same ways, or at least try. Uh, so my goal had always been just to focus on race, race relations, and racism. By the way, if I had to do all over again, I would not have named that place the Jim Crow Museum. Uh, certainly wouldn't have used the term memorabilia, because that has this kind of different connotation. Probably just would have called it the Museum of Racist Objects, or Race Objects, or something like that. Uh, w w when I called it Jim Crow, that's because the objects that we had were from the 1870s to the 1960s, so it made sense to, to have that. And it's been a nice umbrella. Um, but we have objects from yesterday and the day before and the like. And so when people come to the Jim Crow Museum, one of the parts that really jumps out at them are these brand new objects. And they're like, well, we didn't expect this. Well, that's a very important lesson, I mean, because it says that we have to remain vigilant as a culture. Um, so I started looking at other, I remember going to Clayton Rye, uh, one of my colleagues at Ferris, uh, and I said to him, I'm going to start collecting sex as objects. And he was like, where would you start? And I, it was such a profound question. Actually, he could have asked it the other way, which is, where do you what? Where do you finish? It's everywhere. It's every, anybody, anybody ever heard of Spencer's? That store is a freaking museum. I mean, if you ever go in, if they had placards, if they had didactic panels in Spencer's, you would think you're in a museum. And if they charge you too much to get in. I mean, you would think I'm in a museum. And that's a mainstream store, right? So I just start seeing this stuff everywhere. And I thought, okay, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get a focus here. Focus. And so I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll look back at, like, the, the struggle to get the vote. And so I started looking at trade cards and postcards and um, start collecting those. And, of course, what's the message here? Say it out loud. Say it. Yeah, be quiet. Be quiet. Don't talk. Uh, I have a quote that is probably on the next one, but um, it basically let me see if I can get it so I don't have to butcher it. All right, so this is a quote that I made up. It's not especially profound. But what it says is, if it requires courage to speak in a situation, there is something wrong with the situation. Now, I'm a sociologist, and we're the most relativistic of all disciplines. All right? I'm probably the only sociologist in the country who believe there's, that there are absolutes. I'm going to give you an absolute. There is no exception to that rule. There's over 7 billion people on this earth Many, many, many more when you do the math computations. See, we got some mathematicians here. Hello, um, there is, There's not an exception. There is no situation in human experience where it requires courage to speak where there's not, this, where there's not something wrong with the situation. Not one. You can't think of one. But you can think of many where it does require courage to speak. But there's something wrong with the situation. So I started finding all these, um, like, like with African Americans and others, you have certain caricatures and stereotypes. By the way, a caricature is not a stereotype. A caricature would be like Mammy, Tom, Sambo, picking any. Stereotypes are like blacks all like, like uh, watermelon or they're ignorant. They're like these negative attributes that you associate with, with the caricature. Well, I started finding the same thing when, when I was looking at women. 
So I would find, you know, this, the bitch, the nag, the hag, these, these caricatures, the gold digger, whatever, and then I'd find these stereotypes which were attached to those. Does that make sense? So you look at a word like bitch. Now, again, I'm a sociologist. Words, they teach us this first day in sociology. Words have no inherent meaning. They're just sound signs. So if you go to a country where they don't speak English, and you stand out there and you go, shit, shirt, shut, they, they, they're the same thing. <laughs> they sound like the same what? Sound signs, right? But they have very distinctly different meanings, and we share those. We give those sound signs meanings, and then we share those meanings. So the word bitch in and of itself has no inherent meaning, right? But, but it has a meaning. It's like the word nigger. It doesn't have an uh, inherent meaning. And there's a battle over what it does mean or does not mean. Well, so I get all that as a sociologist, but I'm also a social critic. And, and like our founder, Mr. Ferris, someone who's trying to make the world better in my own way. And so I don't like when those words sometimes become mainstreamed in our society. And quite frankly, the battle for the word bitch has been lost. Okay? Now the battle is over that word. And I like this slide for a couple reasons. One of them is this. Sometimes my friends on the left, they'll do a thing that is the thing that they say they don't like on the right. So for example, because people did not like Governor um, Palin's um, politics, they thought it was OK to use the word cunt in reference to her. Whereas if you're a person who studies sexism, you realize it's, you get where I'm going? It's still use of the word to defame and belittle the person. Have you noticed this too, by the way, with almost everybody I've mentioned, I try to give them the, the appropriate, cert, what is it, the title? Have you noticed that? You know what got me in that habit? I'll tell you what got me. It wasn't growing up in the Deep South where they teach us to have manners, though we have manners. It wasn't that. It was recent when I saw many, many people in our country who for eight years would not refer to President Obama as President Obama, but instead referred to him as what? Mr. Obama or Obama. So I'm going to say President Trump. I'm going to have to take a deep breath when I do it, <laughs> but I'm going to say President Trump, you know. So again, this remember the, remember the, the, the um, what is it, the uh, slide I showed you with, with, with uh, Secretary Clinton where she was supposedly, you know, uh, sodomizing uh, President Clinton. So here again is this, this idea that, um, that First Lady Obama, Michelle Obama, that she's not really a woman, all right? Uh, it's not just that she's muscular, but that she has a bulge, which is supposed in some ways to suggest that she has male genitalia, whereas, um, I just forgot her name, um, uh, First Lady Melania Trump, is presented as uh, you know a uh, more traditional feminine um, you know lady as it were. Um, so now keep that slide in mind as I show you the next slide. Now this is from the other side, and so now you have uh, and my daughter. I have two daughters. Um, um, one's at Penn, uh, and I told her you're the first pilgrim to get into an Ivy League school without a mop. And she's like, that is not funny. <laughs> and apparently you don't think it's funny either. Uh, so <laughs> now there's no way they would have let me at Penn or in, and I wouldn't want it to be, you know. The, uh, the Lord wanted me at Ohio State, so that, that worked out well. But anyway, she, she and my other daughter, Gabrielle, who I'll see um, tomorrow in, or day after tomorrow in Chicago, um, they, they introduced me to the term slut shaming. And so they would, you know, I'd see someone and I would make a comment or something. Uh, and they would say, Dad, that's slut shaming. That is slut shaming. You should know better. You're a sociologist. And so then I start looking around and realize that whatever you think of First Lady Trump, I mean, this is an example of slut shaming. Okay? We can get into debates about what would have happened had, had First Lady uh, Michelle Obama been in a magazine or whatever. But the reality is, is that when we have depictions like that, that's an example of slut shaming. So then I turn our attention to, and I'm going to run through this a little faster now, some uh, other groups. Uh, we have a, a, a showcase. Before you get into the Jim Crow Museum, there's a showcase about Native Americans. Uh, and again, you have the various, you know, it's funny. If you go to, a, not funny, haha, -ha, but if you go to a, um, a gun show, 
there is a sort of uh, romanticizing, uh, idealizing of indigenous people. So there is the strong, brave warrior who's fighting the government. Keep that in mind. That's a big part of that. And you know, going to hold their land with all these beautiful attributes, the noble warrior. And then, and then there's the beautiful woman, you know, who is, I mean, almost too beautiful to exist kind of thing. And that's at one extreme. And then the other extreme is sort of, you know, the drunken and the, the, the person who is promiscuous and the person who is uh, scalping other people, even though that's the flipping of history. So here's the showcase I was talking about. There's actually many more objects in there than, than what you can see. Uh, if you go on the internet right now, you'll find uh, a lot of t-shirts. I don't know how I many of you have been to t-shirthell.com, uh, which is my favorite site to, to not like. But there are many. I mean, there's foul mouth. Any, you heard these, these websites, foul mouth t-shirts. There's raw t-shirts. There's just, and the interesting thing, it's like the internet, it's like a hammer, um, you know, a tool which is you can use it to build a house or tear one down, and a one or two people can do incredible damage or incredible good through the internet. So I don't know if the person running T-shirt hell is a person. I don't know if it's 100 people. I don't know what it is. I also know this, that objects which used to be on the fringe or fringes are now mainstream. And so they show up on eBay. They show up in Cafe Press. They show up in these other places, even though at one point they would have been considered fringe. Uh, anybody, has anybody, anybody remember this image? Yeah, good. Uh, so this is like, you know, I think in front of a Cleveland Indians uh, um, a baseball game. And, uh, and so a person who is indigenous, uh, First Peoples Indian, uh, is confronted by a person who is not, but who is actually, by the way, um, I think Puerto Rican, or at least Puerto Rican and European. Um, and so you have this, you know, this person is looking like, what, what are you doing? You're mocking me when you do this. No, I'm honoring you. No, you're mocking me. And so there's this whole kind of debate and discussion going on. But here's the addendum to the story. Here's the, here's the, here's the part you never hear about. Two years later, after conversations, it goes like that. See? So I have hope in when things like that happen. Uh, that two people got together. Again, when people come into Jim Crow Museum, I tell our docents in the sexism collection and in the Jim Crow Museum, you are not charged with changing somebody. You can't do that in 50 minutes. I mean, unless, I mean, you have that whole Saul on the road to Damascus get hit with lightning and in three days of bumbling around turns into Paul. That happens like once every 2,000 years. <laughs> wow, somebody went to church. That, that actually worked here. I say that someplace, oh, this is Grand Rapids. Okay, so I, I, for, I for, forgot where I was for a minute. Said that in New York, and people are like, what the hell is he talking about, you know? It's like one guy in the back, I get it, I get it, I get it. So yeah, but, but, but it doesn't usually work like that. I mean, what, it, what, what, what to improve, to change, to grow deeper, is a kind of sustained peace. Uh, I have to remind myself of that, because when people come into our facility, it's my 10,000th time. It may be their first. And so I have to remind myself of that, but I have to remind other people that work in there, it's not your job to change that person. First of all, you could be wrong. It's not your job to change. And don't you ever crush them. Because if you crush a person, you may get some cathartic good feeling out of that, but the reality is this, once you crush a person, you can never teach them. And you can't teach anyone who watched you crush them. And it's gonna be hard to work with them in any way. Even though the tendency is, especially those of us who are activists, is to let them know where they're wrong. Point it out. Make this indelible imprint on them. Put them in their place. Well, yeah, but after it changes everything. That's not to say you don't scream sometime. So these are just some images that I pick up from. Oh, I got to tell you this story. Stormfront, uh, give me another 10 minutes or so. Is that okay? Yeah, it's like three people like, yeah, it's fine. Um, so Stormfront is like one of the racist, uh, most famous race, uh, white supremacist sites. It's like you can't use the word racist anymore. It's like I was calling the alt-right alt -right racist in Huffington Post and some other places back before it was, I was anti-alt-right before it was cool, right? And so I would say, well, you know, that's kind of just 
it's not just white nationalism, it's white supremacy. And so we were having these conversations. And anyway, I knew about that because of Stormfront. And I, 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 I'm on their websites all the time, and so I'm, I'm, I'm engaged with them. Uh, but anyway, the, the guy that does the cartoons, uh, you know, and even if you're a white supremacist, you still have rights, right? And so if you're an artist and you're a white supremacist, it's still your work, right? Well, I, I stole his work deliberately. I took a couple of his cartoons and put them on our websites. Now, I, I attributed it to him, but he says, don't put, don't put my, web, don't put my uh, work on your site, you blank. I don't have to add the other part. You can use your imagination. And so I was like, no, I'm going to put it on there anyway. So, uh, so eventually he got so angry at me that he ends up writing me this really um, prolifically, dramatically profane email. Uh, it was actually a, a fantastically profane email. <laughs> and at the end of it, he says, in effect, and if you're going to do it anyway, then just go ahead and do it. And so I told our webmaster, I said, see, that's permission. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> <laughs> but we ended, up, we ended up taking it down. Uh, I want to mention real quickly about uh, poor white people. Uh, uh, Native Americans and poor whites are, are similar in ways in terms of how we handle them. In other words, there's this one category that we, we uh, treat as uh, um, noble and praiseworthy, laudatory, and then the other that it's almost like this bipolar kind of thing in that sense. Um, so for example, with poor whites, you have like the Waltons. And so they are, they are um, you know, Christian in a society which is mostly Christian. They are hardworking. They are, are smart. They, are, they have all these, quote, traits, these noble traits, right? Uh, and they don't know when to stop saying goodnight. So you have that, that group. And then you have the group from Deliverance. You know, boy, them shoulders some purdy lips. I mean, you have, if you ever watched the movie Deliverance, that was really disturbing what I did. But, uh, you, you know, the, 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 the one group in a society that we actually use the word trash to describe. That we actually use the word trash. And I, I don't, I don't want to call anybody out, but I recently had a visitor to the Jim Crow Museum. And I don't, this, this almost never happens. But, and so when it does happen, it, 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 it leaves an imprint. And he said to me, I want to say something. He was part of a, a bigger group. He was, he was an older guy. Uh, by that, I mean he was older than, than I am. And so he, he said to me, uh, what do you think about this? What if I were to say to you that there's, there's four kind of people in the world? First of all, that's silly. There's only two kind of people in the world. <laughs> but he says, there's four kind of people in the world. No, no, he says, there's four kind of people in the US. He said, there are good white folks and white trash, and there are Negroes and there are niggers. And I said to him, do you even understand what you just said. So you need to provoke, what, what are you trying to do? What, what is, there's a conversation you're trying to have with me. I'm, I'm, I'm now going to have that conversation with you. But you didn't have to get there that way. And so let's, let, let's now understand something. You just had your turn. And now it's my turn. You, first of all, there, there are Asians, there's, there's I mean, there's uh, bunches of other people. And you can't reduce folk to these simplistic categories. And then what makes you think it's OK for you to word nigga in front of me in that context? Right, so we had, a, we had a little conversation, as it were. I don't usually get, that, get like that. I mean, because for us as a, as a facility to work best, it works best when we don't talk much at all, when we just ask people to tell us what they see and then to listen to what other people see when they're looking at objects. This I saw here. Everybody saw that here? Thank you for putting that in my head. I cannot get that out of my head now. That is such a powerful image. Uh, we recently had a conference in San Francisco, and we were near the Tenderloin District. And I don't know if you've been in San Francisco or near the Tenderloin District recently. It, it will crush your heart to, to see the people. It will crush your heart. Um, you know, I, I, I do a thing where I take various, now, you know, again, as you can see, I'm collecting stuff on other groups. But um, I, 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 uh, I'll ask a question. I'll give you an example. I'll say, so um, what does it mean to go Dutch? Anybody? Yeah. What it really means is, is you want to keep your own money. 
how is that different from the, the stereotypes of Jews? The, the, the stereotype of the Dutch is they want to keep their own money. The stereotype of the Jews is they want to keep their money and get yours, okay? And so there's this idea that, they, that Jewish people like money more than other folks. And you kind of trace sort of the history of the character, the stereotype and all. And so what I would do is I'd talk about Europe and, and certain jobs and, and how these stereotypes get, 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 get manufactured. And then I'll ask this question to the audience. How many of you like money? And by the way, I'll ask you now, how many of you like money? Raise your hands. Don't lie to me. I saw you walk in here. You got out of that fancy car. Okay, you like money. How many of you wish you had more of it? Okay, but we don't associate that with your race or ethnicity. See what I mean? Okay. It's like if somebody black breaks in your house, this is what you know. Somebody black broke in your house. What you don't know is that they broke in your house because they're black. Or that another black person will break in your house. You only know that person broke in your house. And I've been around wealthy white people a lot over the last 20 years, in part thanks to my wife. Um, I thought she was going to be a corporate attorney and I was going to get some of that money, but that didn't work out. She decided to help people. Uh, and so, <laughs> but one, I remember I used to say this to her, oh my goodness, these people, the rich, they drink and they cuss and they fight and they sleep, they do all the same stuff. I don't know if you remember those conversations. It was like a good experience. I was like, wow, all my poor friends from Pritchard, Alabama, Highway 45 should have the opportunity to see what I'm seeing. And they recognize that we're folks, that we're people, flawed souls all. Uh, Asian Americans, the Tojo stereo, uh, caricature, right? Lots of images of that we have. Uh, that mask was actually part of a costume sold in Walmart for like 1563. The significance of that is, is that at 1563, it's financially accessible to a lot of people. Here's the other thing. When, uh, Halloween is a horrible time for race and ethnicity in this country. Um, and uh, stores like Partyland USA and Halloween, whatever it's called, Halloween, Halloween, Halloween something, Halloween USA, Partyland, uh, they sell these costumes. So what do people do when they put on the costume? They act in the way they think that people act. And those of you, how many of the young people in here, I, I, I shouldn't distinguish you like this, but I'm gonna say, how many of the young people in here have heard of pimp and whore parties? Raise your hands. All right, how many of the, the people who don't consider themselves young have heard of pimp and whore parties? Oh, there's actually a couple, yeah. There's usually almost no one. So what happens when you go to a pimp and whore party? You dress like you think a pimp and whore would dress. You, you get me? And so you see these middle class white kids darkening up or whatever, and they're like walking around acting, I'm like, w so it becomes a way of acting out very much like that 1890 something song, the sheet music, where we act out entertainment, racism as entertainment. Uh, this is a shirt I actually saw in San Francisco. Uh, now I just got back from, from um, um, where did we just get back from? Uh, the DR, Dominican Republic. Can I tell, can I tell a really bad story? Uh, no, I shouldn't. All right, fine. I, I won't tell it. Uh, yeah, I won't tell it. Uh, all right, so anyhow, so I, I'm going to go ahead and tell it. So, that, uh, so anyway, I got sick because my, my peg said, don't drink the water. And I'm like, that's some uh, first world bourgeois, blah, blah, you know. And I'm like, you know what? I'm a, I'm a man of the people, <laughs> right? I'll brush my teeth with this water as much as I want. So, you know, like eight pounds later, uh, you know, I'm, 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 it was bad. It was all over Facebook and everything. So the part that didn't make Facebook, because I, I'm aware of boundaries and I know not to share too much. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> I should not be telling this story. So anyway, I'm in the room, I'm sick, and I, I don't like being sick, no one does, but I really, I'm like Sheldon on uh, the Big Bang Theory. I really don't, I really, really, really don't. Penny, Penny, I really don't like being sick. And so anyway, I'm in a bed. She's out at the, at the beach because her primary concern is her tan and, and, and not the bowels that we took many, many years earlier. And so I'm, 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 I'm like laying in bed, except I'm sick and I'm really, really, really sick. And I put out the sign on the door that says, do not disturb, all right? And my Spanish is practically zero, all right? And I say that not bragging or complaining, it's just a statement of fact. And so I put the sign out that says, do not disturb, and the door starts opening. But I see she's out there on the, on the beach. I'm in there in the room alone. 
Now, I should also mention that I was as naked as a catfish. And so I'm laying on top of the spray. See, I tell you, should I stop? Are you, are you interested? Should I just leave them hanging? So anyway, uh, now the one word I do know is vermouth. You know, and I'm like screaming, no, stop, stop, get away, get away. And she opens the door and she comes right in. And there I am on top of the covers, uh, as naked as, as the truth. And, um, and I did what anybody, any man my age would do. I sucked in my stomach, is what I did. So that was, <laughs> and, and, and resolved to learn Spanish as soon as we got back to, to here. So I have a few images that I want to show you. Uh, actually, I'm almost there yet. This image right here, uh, this is one of those that gets seared in your brain. I, I would say to people sometimes, if you don't think words matter, then be quiet. And if you don't think images matter, then close your eyes. But it doesn't work with images because the images are already in our brains. And this is one that's been in my brain a lot. The, these young kids, they're on their way to an internment camp. Um, and over 100,000 uh, people were interned in the US, you know, placed in camps. And two-thirds of them, they were U.S. citizens. They were Japanese ancestry, but they were U.S. citizens. Also, about 2,000 whites went to camps with them. Uh, they weren't supposed to be married to them because it was against the law, but they were married to them. They were family members and the like. Uh, and there they are, on their way to an uncertain future. And they're, 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 they're showing the V sign for victory. You know, the military, you know, the, the V sign. And they're waving the flags. We are Americans, too. We are Americans, too. Uh, and this is the, the whole wall thing uh, going on. I, I did not think I would live long enough to, to hear talk of a wall. I actually, to be honest with you. Um, I, you know, uh, immigration is an incredibly complicated uh, pr uh, situation for every nation. For every nation. It's incredibly complicated. But, 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 but here's, and now I, I just got to get this off my chest. Um, there, there's a segment of our society that deals with, this is going to sound really harsh and I apologize. There's a segment of our society that deals with complicated social problems by building gates and hiring people to watch the gates. And we have family members that live in gated communities. And by the way, I'm not saying, you know, live like you live. This is the U.S. That's on you. That's fine. And because often on the other side of the gates, I mean, there's golf, there's food, there's, you know, a lot of good stuff on the other side of the gates. But you can't turn the whole country into a gated community. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Senator uh, McCain. And the part that I want to see, I uh, want to show you, is he was at a conference and he was talking uh, uh, about where, we, where the world is going. And there's just a part about how the folks who helped create the, the Munich Security Conference, how they would be alarmed by an increasing turn away from universal values toward old ties of blood and race. And if you, if, you, if you do the internet that I do, if you just watch and listen, we're using language of blood and race that we have not used in this country for decades. Language that I have not heard since I was a child growing up in George Wallace's uh, Alabama. And I am hearing that same language today, old language of blood and race. So I'd like to end with um, some images. I think there's about five images here. Uh, the first one I just wanted to show because uh, sheet music, which we have a lot of, is often framed as art. And uh, years ago when we did our first traveling exhibit, I toyed with the idea of naming it nasty art. But I just, the word art, just like the word memorabilia someone mentioned earlier, it just had uh, this really positive connotation, and I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. But in many people's homes, what I would consider racist, and, and, and by the way, I think it does not have to be racist to be in the Jim Crow Museum. It just has to be something which helps us talk about race, race relations, and racism. But things that I personally would consider racist, I see hung as art. This actually is, uh, there was a Canadian artist who did this for our traveling exhibit. Um, I'm not going to talk anymore about lynching. Uh, I, I, I just don't feel like doing it right now. 
Um, but anyway, that's a piece that we have in our traveling collection. Uh, this is a piece from Lester White from uh, Grand Rapids. Actually, uh, Bayard, uh, where's Bayard? Oh, right here, bless your heart. Uh, he, he actually helped me find this artist. And uh, because I told him I, I wanted to have some art in the, in the new Jim Crow Museum, which, I hate this word, which helped us deconstruct um, you know, the, the racist imagery. And so he found Lester White. And, and, and Rastus, the cream of wheat butler, you know, is, is happy to serve. He's the, the so-called Tom caricature. Uh, but if you notice, his finger. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have this piece right here from John Lockhart, who, who passed away. Um, and uh, actually, he was the, uh, a mentor to John uh, McDonald, who painted the mural um, for, for the Jim Crow Museum, our Cloud of Witnesses mural, which, which I'm proud of. But this piece by John Lockhart, and um, I just love this piece because what it's basically saying is, is I ain't your mammy. And so again, just like we look at the racist pieces and ask people, what is it you see? When someone comes to the museum, we would look at that and ask them, what is it you see? And he, he is my colleague, he was my colleague from the University of Michigan. Uh, this piece right here from Michael Ray Charles, and Michael Ray Charles and I now are sideways, I don't need to get into that. Uh, but, but anyhow, um, one of my, one of my problems is, is that I think his work sometimes uh, extends the thing that's being satirized, if that makes sense. If people don't get the satire, you're just making more of the stuff that you're supposedly satirizing. Does that make sense to anybody? And he's well paid to do it. Uh, so I want to share a couple pictures here. We've discovered a story at Ferris recently. I'm so proud of Mr. Ferris. I, whenever, whenever I talk about Mr. Ferris, I start sounding like I work for advancement and marketing. And I, I that's, I, it is what it is. The more I learned, when he was a child, his father took him to hear um, Frederick Douglass. And it made an incredible impact on him. In 1902, he brought in Booker T. Washington to speak at Ferris. In 1903, he read from the souls of black folks, uh, W.B. Du Bois's book, to the Ferris student body. Between 1910 and 1928, he had a relationship with Hampton Institute, which is today Hampton University, where they brought students from there to Ferris State or actually Ferris uh, Institute at the time, to finish their college. Among that group were people that changed, I'm not exaggerating, that changed the United States. One of them, and by the way, how many of you knew that story? Raise your hands. Good, a couple people, yes. Well, we're gonna tell that story everywhere because we're proud of that story because our founder was first team All-American, okay? Uh, anyway, one of them is uh, Bedford Lawson, who was the first African-American to argue and win a case before the United States Supreme Court, not Thurgood Marshall. He was Thurgood Marshall's mentor before they got sideways. But he was also a mentor to Martin Luther King. He was also a mentor to presidents and all. He walked the campus at Big Rapids, all right? And, and um, amazing. Uh, by the way, these paintings were done by Diane Cleland, who is a graduate of the great, the great, the great, no, Kendall College of Art and Design. Isn't that, isn't that good? Yeah, that's good. So you thought I was saying Ohio State. Not everybody is from Ohio State. Uh, but John Glenn is, and Jesse Owens is, and David Pilgrim is. And, uh, I'm just joking to put my name in there. Don't worry about that. But anyway, this right here is Percival Prattis. Percival Prattis was the first African American to be admitted before the uh, press corps for the uh, United States Senate and, 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 and House of Representatives. Was editor of, actually, I'll tell you what, at one time, the editors of the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, where my father was, the, the, the Amsterdam News, the, um, I'm missing, uh, the Baltimore Afro-American, these major newspapers which helped lure African Americans to the North in the Great Migration. At one point, they were almost all those people who had come through Ferris from Hampton. Almost all. Okay. Uh, and, and actually, Percival Fitzgerald, he not only became a, a, a um, and I can't even pronounce the word. Can anybody pronounce that? Yeah, yeah, that. Uh, he not only did that, but, but has a claim as, a, as one of the Harlem Hellfighters who have the reputation of never having lost a battle and never having left a person behind. So um, I want to show you this mural. When you come to the museum, um, this is the mural that was painted by John McDonald. And I have seen his slavery um, uh, series. And so I, I went to him and I said, um, I want you to paint this mural 
that is our cloud of witnesses. So when we talk about race, when we talk about justice, we'll have our, we'll have our, we'll have our witnesses behind us to make sure we, we have a good conversation. And I want people who were killed. And don't ever say again that Martin Luther King gave his life, or Reverend King gave his life. He was murdered, he was killed. He knew that there were attempts on his life, but he was killed. Don't say that Minister Malcolm gave his life. He was killed, there's a difference. You get where I'm going? Their lives were taken from it. They could still be alive today, all right? They, they, and, 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 and so anyway, I said, well, I guess you have to put those two, but put whoever, he's like, well, I'm not sure. Tell me what you want. I says, listen, my brother. You do it any way you want to do it, just do it right. <laughs> and so he came back with this mural, and I think he did it right. And one of the things that he did was underneath, and I don't think you can tell, uh, but un yeah, you can a little bit, uh, but underneath them, and, and those students right there I actually think are from Kent State, by the way. But if you look under there, what do you see under the, the people's faces? Their names. And you know why you put their names? Two reasons because we've already forgotten the names of people. That's number one. And you know the other reason, more fundamental than that? Because they had names, all right? They're no unnamed people. They had names. Uh, this is the last story. Um, so uh, years ago, I have a colleague, Philip Middleton. Actually, he's retired now, one of my best friends in life. Um, but anyway, Philip Middleton and I, uh, Philip used to like to get me to take his class so he could be doing something else, I think. And so he would go to a conference or whatever, and he'd say, can you take my class? I'm going to a conference. And I'd say, oh, okay, fine. And so one time I took his class into the Jim Crow Museum, and this is when we were in a little 500-square-room place. And after it was over, there were two people left. There was an a African-American woman and a European-American. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying how people present to me. I mean, you don't know what people's races are. I mean, um, anyway. And uh, the rest of the class left, and they were both older than the older than the other students. And so I was like just standing there, you know, trying to be a good teacher and everything, and, and everybody else was gone. And they were both crying. And I'm not trying to get emotional here or anything, but they were both crying. And so the the black woman, it was it was kind of like, oh my God, what would make people do this? What would I mean? Out of, out of what part of your brain comes hatred that is this sustained? And, and, and so I kind of, you know, you want to you wanna be there. I mean, you want to be the master teacher, right? And so I was trying to talk to her about mostly just trying to listen. And then eventually she left. And it was clear to me that the, the man who was in there was not going to leave anytime soon. And so I went over to talk and, or, or talk and listen. And I remember he said to me, he was like, he was getting emotional, which happens. Now, a lot of times, you would think this would happen more in an outward way. And, and most of the time, what, what I think people feel is a kind of profound sadness. But it's not, it doesn't bubble up. Sometimes it does, but not always. Or not even often. But anyway, he was there. And then he just starts crying. And he's just crying. And so I'm like, hey, you know, it's all right. It's all right. He was like, no, 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 no. It's not all right. He says, I, I want to tell you something. He said, I'm sorry. And I was like, brother, you didn't do this. Don't worry about it. I said, yeah, we, I understand and you understand that a society based on that stuff means that some of us benefit today, some of us, whatever. I said, but, but you didn't do this. You didn't make this image. You didn't do this. He said, I know that. He said, but I just, I just need you to know I'm sorry. And I was like, okay. I, I, I received that. That's fine. And so it just, so anyway, eventually he left. And so I'm driving home. And from Rockford, from, from uh, Big Rapids to Rockford is like, you know, 44 minutes or whatever, 45 minutes. Uh, but who's counting, right? And so I, I'm in my car home. And when I, I'm driving home, and by the time I hit, like, Cedar Springs, that part of it, I'm just, I'm just crying. I mean, and it's not like my indigenous brother, you know, with the single tear because of the, the, the littering. Did you get that one? All right. Um, I mean, it's an actual cry. You know, and I'm like, man, why is that? Why is that messing with me now? And by the I got home, I was like, I was wiped out. And I was like, man. And then it, it kind of hit me the more I thought about it. I, I didn't know this guy. I don't think I, he may be here today. Uh, I, I didn't know his name. I didn't know anything about him. Um, 
But him saying he was sorry, it, it just it went in here because I realized after all these years of collecting this stuff, I needed to hear one person say they were sorry. And, and that, I tell you, it, 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 it kind of made me understand what reconciliation is. Reconciliation is, it's, it's at least two souls meeting. I don't want to get all weird on you. But the, the, one of the ways you can get there is through crying. You can't stay there. I, I don't think I'll ever get over that day. So anyway, the last image is just an image which is not pulling up. And the reason I show that is because I, I think it says something about my need to grow, which is for a long time when I saw this image, all I saw was the hate. And so why is it that I only saw the hate? Now, when I look at it, I see that it's taught choices that we have to make. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. Are you unplugging me? bring this to you. So if anyone has a question for Dr. Pilgrim, now's the time. Sir, I'm coming at you. So yeah, we'll do a little bit of this. That'll be good. It's a pleasure to see you again, Dr. Thank Pilgrim. Thank you. It's good to see you. Um, and you kept your word with me. I'm the gentleman from the Mel Trotter Dent Breakfast three years ago who begged you to come back and you did so thank well, you thank you um that picture you and by the way don't just skip over that Mel Trotter uh, everybody know Mel Trotters yeah. I don't know why you still have money in your pocket when you should be giving some of that to Mel Trotter that's number one number two they actually have grits uh, <laughs> and and you don't get good grits in other places you go someplace and they serve you cream of wheat and it's an insult they actually have grits go ahead my name is Rodney, and my direct question to you is that photograph you show comes up from the initiative out of the Berlin Conference from 1884 right. and 1885. Right. Well, you are a doctor, but there's so many people who don't know who Richard Baker, right. Friedrich Hegel, right. and uh, Sam Baker, what they did. Right. So right. why aren't we going to the fact that they went to the humanity of the woman of color right. and dehumanized her to that point? Right. And that is the solution, right. which they base none of that on scientific fact. Right. Right. So, but that's not being pointed out. Right. Why, why is that being left well, off the uh, table? First of all, I, I think, well, that, those are great questions. I think, um, uh, first of all, we talk about race a lot in the U.S., but we usually talk about it in corridors, in bathrooms, in our living rooms. What we don't talk about race and injustice is in places where our ideas get challenged. And so if we, if we, if we have, and, 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 and some people are doing this, but, but, but we like happy history. We like history with, with parades and, and, and that kind of happy history. The, the difficult lessons of history, uh, it, it takes a commitment. And one, I think uh, President Clinton actually tried to do this, where he wanted to, to create sustained dialogues where we have those discussions and we have those conversations, but it, 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 didn't, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't catch on. So what, what, what my suggestion would be is this, that in, in every little place where people are committed, just do the work. Just do the work. And, and, and it's not, I mean, there's some wonderful lessons. I have a lecture which is all, uh, which is all hugs and, and kisses. Okay, this wasn't it. But, um, I mean, just do the work. And so, uh, but you're right, there, there's a lot of discussions we're not having. Um, okay, so I want to give some context to this because I have that burning like feeling where I really want to talk about it. Um, as a person of color who is not necessarily represented and has a background that isn't represented in spaces like these or like higher education, et cetera, I come to a lot of these events and I think, and this is an assumption, which is not so great with a sociology background, but um, I think we come to these events and we see there are populations or subpopulations that are missing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we come here and we feel good about ourselves and then we leave and then sometimes when we ask like what's the next step in terms of kind of getting towards this more like equitable society um, beyond just like reading and dialogue, right? This is an exercise in public sociology. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend 
for the people who are predominantly make up these spaces of um, having these progressive talks and learning more about it, what is your recommendation um, beyond just going to the Jim Crow Museum at FSU, um, reading and dialogue? Mm -hmm. So first of all, let's don't diminish the value of dialogue though, right? Um, if, you, if, you're, if you work in higher ed and you don't believe in dialogue, uh, you know, that's, so I, I believe in the tri, I don't, I, don't, I don't just believe in dialogue. I believe in the triumph of dialogue. I believe we talk till we fix it, all right? And that's higher ed, that's, that's, my, that's who I am. That's not just sociology. If we don't believe that as a nation, get rid of the 3,000 colleges, okay? But intelligent dialogue does not just have to occur on, on college campuses. In temples, churches, synagogues, we, we have it going on. Um, so anyway, I, I just I want to I want to stand up for dialogue, you know, which is kind of it. I but today Tony Baker, um, who's back there and who's wondering why I haven't mentioned him so far, uh, he took us to a couple of places today. Uh, we actually went to more than a couple, but in a couple of places. And, and Tony, you may want to stand up for a minute if, if, and help me with the places. But this is what I thought at. Uh, Tony, what was the name of the place where they were doing art? Uh, where are you? Is Tony gone? Oh, so forget that then. Uh, so anyway, Tony did nothing today. Uh, um, but actually, where I was going, going with this is this. He took us to a, a school facility, and they were reaching people. They were using art as a way of making people's lives better, teaching them to think deeper giving them jobs and the like. We went to another place, again, where is he? Which was a corporation. They were so, it was, it was like, they blew, me, blew my mind first. And again, I, I apologize for not knowing the, the name of the place. I, I, she put it on her website or something when I get back. But this company was, they had committed themselves to taking every fifth grader in the Grand Rapids public school system to see Lake Michigan. Every single one of them. Now, that may not sound like a big thing, but growing up poor, I, I, I know what it's like not to be able to, to get, in, get into something or go somewhere or travel. But they were also helping people with like just skills. In other words, those two companies were doing the things they can do. Part of what we can do is to work with companies, work with corporations, work with neighborhoods to help them find a way to do some stuff. And it wasn't like, like Big Brother are, are, I'm trying to get an award. I mean, there's more awards given in Grand Rapids than any city in the United States. So it wasn't like trying to get an award. It was about people really finding each other. So my, my, I, my, sh my short answer is this, that I believe through dialogue that we can find the needs of a specific area, and not just the needs, because what, 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 what is a little offensive is when the rich, powerful, often white group comes into an area to help folks. Uh, but, 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 but it's not offensive for that group and any other group of people to work together for, for a better, better culture. Uh, our founder, uh, Mr. Ferris, I mean, made our motto as an institution, our slogan as an institution, our mission as an institution was to make the world better. So I have no short answer, I mean, I have no specific answers uh, about a specific location, but mine is more of a, of a, of a philosophy, it's an approach which is to look at what's needed in an area, to look at what's possible in an area, and then just start to work. Just muddle forward. Just muddle forward. You know, I have folks that don't like the way we do it in the Jim Crow Museum, but here's the thing. They're, this is the way we clean the river, and their pant legs are dry. So I wish I, again, I wish I had a more specific answer about a specific, because there, there's, there's answers about healthcare, there's answers about, you know, giving people access to, to education, like, there's also peace, you know, there, there's ways we need to make sure that all groups are represented, that, that images. Um, the, I was just trying to think, there was something I just saw, uh, well, I don't want to get it, because it's, uh, uh, well, anyway, we, we have to become storytellers. We have to tell, uh, tell stories, find all the mediums to tell stories. We have to find ways to empower people to do it. Uh, there's a zillion answers. So I feel like I, the more I say, the less I'm answering your question. So. You mentioned Wade in the Water. Mm -hmm. you, or, or you mentioned the center mm -hmm. the Water. Mm -hmm. So then I thought of Wade in the Water. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you done any work with how the black community responded over these decades mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. defend themselves mm -hmm. spiritually? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so the first Jim Crow Museum, the one that was in a small space, it was only racist objects. That was a deliberate approach because America has a lot of black history museums. It had no racism museum. So, uh, but, but more and more African Americans, including my, 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 my mentee, now colleague, Khalid L. Hakim, whose name used to be Stanley Bell when he was my student. Uh, when, when he was a student of mine, he challenged me. It's like, why are you only collecting this racist stuff? Why aren't you showing black people responding and accomplishing great things, right? Jack Johnson, the great fighter in prison, coming out with a patent for the wrench, right? All these, I mean, so I was like, no, but we're a racism museum. <laughs> like, yeah, we're not a black history museum. Go, go, to, go to Detroit for that. And when we redesigned this place, I realized that, that that was telling not the whole story. So in the facility we have now, we have a section on African American achievement and African American responses. In part, that's what that art was, you know? But it's not just that, it's also the civil rights movement was, was a response, but also just inventing things was a response, you know? Becoming doctors, lawyers, those people that we're, we're talking about, those were all, all responses. And the thing that I want to see most in this part is, is that we get outside the February group, you know, and, and, and start talking about people who's, whose names we, do, we don't know. And it's the same thing with, with the sexism collection, not making the same mistake this time. Uh, again, America has women's studies museums. It doesn't have a sexism museum. But even if you're gonna have a sexist collection, it's important to show how women you know, did, weren't just passive sponges, but that they fought back and they, they, they accomplished great things. And so you have a person like Alice Marble who you know, sexually assaulted, hurt, all this other kind of thing, not only became a great tennis player and a spy, but became a racial justice activist. You have Peace Pilgrim who walked the circumference of the earth because she didn't have money. Hey, you're talking about something you can do. She had no power, so she started walking. So she walked from the East Coast to the West Coast and back, and then walked from the East Coast to the West Coast and back, and then walked from the East Coast to the West Coast and back, and then walked from the East Coast to the West Coast and back, all the time talking to people about peace as she understood it, and then walked from the East Coast to the West Coast and back and back and back seven or eight times. She walked the circumference of the earth. So we do what we can do. Maybe we can just take a couple more and then go ahead. Yes, how you doing? I appreciate you for your coming out here and bringing this topic up because it's, excuse me, let me introduce myself. My name is Taj Gillespie from Grand Rapids, born and raised. And um, I appreciate the problem because it should build character to be able to create the solution. What we're doing here should be solution driven because we we know what we've come through with the Jim Crow. I'm a product of the new Jim Crow mass incarceration and our children is facing that every day. And I know that each one of us is here for Jim Crow because a lot of you come from that era where therefore you are a product of Jim Crow as, as well. Your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents and the things that change that is only one and it's the heart. And the heart, the condition of a heart dictates the outcome is of its people. And the conditions of the heart shows the outcome of the people. So until we check that part of us, man, we will never have no solutions to overcome this aspect of Jim Crow. We still facing it every day. Every day my children face it. We, they still pulling guns on us like we criminals. And we pay their taxes. I'm gonna say that again. We pay their taxes. And we're decriminal we are criminalized because of our environment and because of our skin color. And when you look at us, you're intimidated. And you fear strength. And it's okay. Accept it. But don't judge it and you don't know or understand what it's been through. You don't know the story. So you can't judge someone's story if you never read ever read it. And most times we're judgmental. We point fingers and we're not strong enough to stand against falsehood because we've been taught weakness our whole life. So this is what today is the day that things need to change, man, because judgment is near. And if you ain't prepared for it, you will get caught up in it. 
that's my that's what okay. I'm saying. Uh, well, you thank got you. It. thank you, sir. Thank you. So a couple things you mentioned. One is uh, I think one of the failings of my generation was we stopped telling stories, and I think we had fatigue. Uh, I think uh, actually we had misfounded or misguided shame, and so a lot of African Americans in my uh, generation just stopped telling the stories. The problem with not telling the stories is that they didn't tell the story of the triumph on the other side. So here's a weird way to look at it. When, when I look at the Jim Crow Museum with all that ugliness, what I see is the people that, 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 that did amazing things despite that. And so we stopped telling that story. Uh, we, and we're gonna run out of time here, but I want to tell you, I was watching the Motown, um, this, the, uh, what do you call those info commercials? Uh, and it was Motown, it was the night Michael, Michael Jackson did the moonwalk backwards. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, yeah. And so they were showing that, that and so it's four o'clock in the morning because I can't sleep and I'm reading stuff. And I'm watching this, this thing and, and I look on there. This is the weirdest thing that happened. I'm watching it and Michael, he's doing the moonwalk. Not, not, as, not as well as I would do it, but I mean he's doing the, the moonwalk backwards. And, uh, and I, I look in the audience and most of the people are African American and they, they're pretty. You know what I'm saying? They're dressed all, they got suits on and, and, and obviously they're, you know, some wealth in there and on the stage is you know Smokey, Smokey Robinson and the, the Supremes and all these people and everybody's having a good time and for one one brief moment my thought was this why am I doing this why don't I just dance I don't mean that facetiously or anything I'm not making that up I had in my mind why don't we just all dance why don't we just have a good time you know like eat drink and be merry if this is all there is then let's just eat drink and be merry and then it passed because the reality is, is that whether we dance or not, and sometimes we should dance, like uh, Marvin and Vandell is dancing in the streets. I mean, we should get in the streets and dance if we can agree on the music. But anyway, um, but when we get done dancing, the reality is, is that is that we have a society that where we need to do some work. So thank you very much. Can we one more. Done? One more. Okay. One more. One more. One more. It'll be quick. Okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you taking one more question. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you've already heard of um, the peanut guys mm -hmm. uh, error. My question to you is uh, based on uh, race and the economy. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the amount of money that the prison systems mm -hmm. bring in mm -hmm. um, after slavery was mm -hmm. abolished and mm -hmm. the peanut guys replaced mm -hmm. slavery, mm -hmm. do you, how, much, how much do you think um, society would change with the amount of money the prison systems bring in with the injustice that, you know, is facing, like, African-American males. Because, the, you know, the prison mm -hmm. systems, man, you know, there's mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. you know, you can invest in mm -hmm. stocks mm -hmm. and whatnot. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. as soon as slavery, slavery was a mm -hmm. $300 billion industry back mm -hmm. then. And, mm -hmm. you know, once the Civil War was hit, slavery, you know, the South, they need to, you know, mm -hmm. they needed to bring in their money. So my question to you is, the amount of money that the, the mm -hmm. prison systems are bringing in, do you do you think that like there's a chance that things will change? Because our economy mm -hmm. is, we make so much money off the prison mm -hmm. system. Well, first of all, Peonage, uh, have you read uh, A Slaver by Another Name, uh, which is the sort of a, a history of Peonage after slavery and what it was? Uh, and actually, in the book I just wrote, I talk about even in the 1920s and 1930s, how African Americans were arrested for things like vagrancy and loitering, and then would be uh, hired out to a farm, a prison farm, and uh, were virtually in slavery again. If you have not read the book uh, "Slavery by Another Name," which is sort of the history of peonage, then 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 do that because it's uh, it's a part of history that we don't know. Slavery did not end with slavery ending, if that's what you mean. Uh, I think both scholars agree that the peonage system uh, existed in form, especially in the deep south where I'm from. Uh, so that's, that's the first part of that. So it's a, a good thing to mention. The, the, the part about how much the American economy is influenced by the, the prison system, I have to tell you, I, 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 don't, I, would, need, I would need to study more to, to, to have an intelligent response. What I can say is this, um, when you look in our prisons, uh, let's say you, 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 if you're a conservative, then you say that, uh, at least the conservative position in part is, is that, you know, uh, people in prison because they do bad things and whatever, and, and I think liberals would agree with that too, some, but, but that's what's, but if you're a progressive, whatever, you look at the, the institutional 
the society itself and the way it's run, and you notice that certain groups go to prison. So you can decide which of those you like or don't like, but here's the thing about being a sociologist. We do a lot of this, just counting and observing. And so this is what I observe, that no matter what state I go in, uh, that the prison population looks a whole lot like the poor population and that it looks a whole lot like minority populations. Um, and we can debate till we, you know, the consequences of that, we can debate the cost of that, we can debate the origins of that, but the reality is this. Our prison population looks a whole lot like the populations we used to lynch and execute. And so I, what, I, what I have enjoyed, and I, I know Michelle Alexander, uh, 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 her book blew up, you know, uh, The New Jim Crow. But I think the value of her book is, is that it got people who otherwise wouldn't be talking about this whole, you know, take, you know this, this pipeline, as it were, to prison, and got people talking about, you know, what prison life means, because here's the reality. There's two parts of, there's two things we don't think about a lot when we're in our homes. <clears throat> one is people going to sleep tonight in a prison. Most folks are not thinking, but you're sitting at home eating, watching, you know, the NBA, or not you, I mean anybody, or watching whatever, watching soap operas if they still have those. We're not thinking about people in prison, all right? But here's the other thing that we go to sleep not thinking about, and this drives me insane, and I think it is related. In almost every city in the United States, there is a bad part of town. What the hell are we doing with bad parts of town in the United States? Why, am I, why, why are we even having that discussion? Why are they, you know who, you know who thinks about what life is like in the bad part of town? The folks live in there. The rest of the folks are just living their lives. Either literal gates, gated communities, or metaphorically gated communities. And that's related. So it's the same kind of principle to think, and please let this be the last thing to go, but, but to, <laughs> but, I would say to my students all the time, are, are you patriotic? And they'd be like, oh yeah, we love America. I was like, so I'm not talking about you crying when you hear the national anthem. I'm not talking about you get, I mean, that's fine, cry. I'm not talking about you putting your hand over your heart and looking stern, and I'm, good, do that. But real patriotism to me would mean that you care about Americans. And that'd be black ones too. That'd be brown ones too. That'd be red, you know what I'm saying? That'd be poor ones also. So real, pay, if you want to make America great, fix that. Yeah, fix that. And we go to bed every night in this, in, in this nation. Not just Grand Rapids, St. Louis. And when I go places to talk, I tell them, take from the airport. I say, do me a favor. Take me to the richest community in this city. Now take me to the poorest community. You don't have to be a sociologist. No, I'm seeing the same thing in every, in every city. That's a pattern. So ask yourself this question, why do we have bad sections of town in this city on the top of the hill? So thank you very much.